All attempts in our world to change the rules so that people of God face a choice. Compromise or face the consequences. As I encounter you, Lord, I'm surrendering. You give me hope, hope I can share. As I encounter you, you call me your child. You give me a family. I finally feel authenticity. Now watch the darkness, please. We lift high. As we lift high your name, we are changed. As we encounter you, you're softening our hearts. Play our part, and we should study. As we encounter you, you draw me to unity, authentic community, gathered in love. As I encounter you, you're healing my hurts, my blind eyes can finally see. I finally feel authenticity. Watch the darkness leave as we live by your name. We are changed as we encounter you. You're softening our hearts, play our part, and reach this hurting world. Now we live. No other name deserves your fame, Lord Jesus. No other name deserves a claim above you, Jesus, Jesus. And now we bear the hope you gain, Lord Jesus. As we you afresh as we gather this morning, Lord, that our hearts would be transformed, that our hurts would be healed, that forgiveness would flow on us and to others. And as we lift high your name, we proclaim the name of Jesus. No other name deserves your fame, Lord. And so we come to hear, to sit, to listen and to respond. Amen. Amen. Days of hell with sorrow Just to lay, leave your worries 
Jesus is very near. He lowers us to raise us. We can sing His praises, whatever is His way, all is well. He makes us rich and poor, that we might trust Him more, whatever is His way. Changes come from Him, He who never changes. I'm now firm in the cross, on the cross of all the ages, all is well with my
Good morning, church. Um, this this is um, the last sermon in our series, and um, next week is going to be a little bit different. Javen's going to be talking about what we're, we'll be doing next week, and uh, we're looking at the steps to freedom in Christ. So um, expect something a bit different next week to what we've done normally. Um, but this is where this series has been going. And um, there's going to be a checklist. There's going to be a prompt sheet of things that we go through and identify areas of our life where God may be wanting to bring healing and wholeness. So just be open to what we're doing next week. Um, just remember that it will be a bit different. Let's pray. Father God, be with us as we uh, look at this last sermon. Uh, forgiving from the heart. Father God, uh, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your work in our lives. Father, we pray that this uh, this message will speak to us. And we pray that uh, during this next week, you'll be preparing us for, for the following Sunday, which will be different. But uh, we pray that you will use those steps to freedom in Christ to bring real healing into our lives. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears in Jesus' name. In your, amen. Now, in your mind, um, what is the sin that gives Satan his greatest opportunity? Is it witchcraft? Is it occult activity, sexual immorality, cults and sex? Do you know there is a sin that destroys families? It splits churches, it divides nations. So what is that sin? It's... Um, it's uh, the inability to, to, to forgive, to release people from our resentment and anger. Well, why should I forgive? The first reason to forgive is simply because God tells us to. And when it, when it comes to forgiveness, this issue, first and foremost, it's about our relationship with God. It's not about what happened between us and the other person. It's between us and God. And in the Lord's Prayer, we pray these words, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And so you see from that, um, those words that there's actually a connection uh, between our relationship with each other and our relationship with God. No man is an island. An island. We can't live a holy life in isolation to others. In fact, our relationship with others is a reflection of our relationship with God. We look at someone's relationship with his brothers and sisters and we see the quality of their relationship with God. And John says, whoever claims to love yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And, and these words um, in uh, Philippians 4, verse 2, um, the apostle says, I appeal to Euodia and I appeal to Syntyche to come to an agreement in the Lord. Now, that's all it says about those two women. Uh, we don't know much about them. They're not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. But we know that they had a disagreement. We don't know what the disagreement was about or how it was resolved. But we do know that this disagreement was having a detrimental effect on the community, on the, on the faith community, on the fellowship in the church. And, and Paul is concerned about this. And uh, this church at Philippi was a glowing church. Paul raves, he, he says things like, every time I think of you, I'm filled with joy. Just imagine you received a letter from someone that said that. Every time I think of you, my heart is filled with joy. So, so Paul loved these Philippian believers. His heart, and, and yet there was this, this issue with these two women. And uh, Paul is concerned about it. And he pleads with his women, these women to settle their difference. Because conflicts can fester and they can lead to bitterness and resentment. 
Now we, we looked at that little video on Mana and Vili. Please pray for Mana and Vili because where they in the minute they've been there a number of years and a number of people confide in them and there are Mana was talking about a difference of opinion a difference that was healed. Did you pick that up where he talked about a relationship that was reconciled? Well, a big part of their work or part of their work is just helping people to reconcile their differences, bringing people together again. So pray for them as they do that. So what is the secret of continuing to walk with freedom in Christ? Release other people from the prison of your resentment. Whoever has been forgiven little loves little. In order to effectively forgive from the heart, you need to have experienced something first. You need to have experienced the weight of God's forgiveness in your life. In Luke 7, a Pharisee named Simon throws a party and, and Jesus is invited and a woman of the city invites herself. She just turns up. Now, this is a Pharisee party, and you can imagine what a Pharisee party is like. There are things you do and there are things you don't do. Now, this woman breaks all the rules of a Pharisee party, and she does things you're not supposed to do. She gets down on her knees at Jesus' feet. She pulls out all her precious ointments. She starts washing Jesus' feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. Well, that's outrageous at a Pharisee party. And then she goes further. She anoints his feet with oil. And while she is doing this, she's kissing his feet continually. If you were a Pharisee, how would, that, how would you be impacted by that? This is a Pharisee party. They have strict rules about what you do and what you don't do. And Simon wonders to himself, if this man, if he really was a prophet, he would know what's going on here. He would know what kind of woman this is. He would not allow this woman to touch his feet if he really knew her background. And Jesus turns the table on Simon. And he says, do you see this woman, Simon? I came into your house, you did not give me any water to wash my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. You know, Simon knew the law of Moses as well as any of the Pharisees in that room. But this woman knew something else. She knew what it meant to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. She knew what it meant to have her debt cancelled. She knew what it meant to walk with God in newness of life. She didn't have all the head knowledge like Simon had, but she knew it in here. She had it in here. She had a vibrant love and relationship with God. In Matthew 18, and um, pardon me for the reading, the reading actually should have come from um, Matthew 18 today, um, Matthew 18, it tells a parable um, about the kingdom of heaven. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that they had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you back everything. This was an impossible debt. 
a debt he couldn't possibly pay. But the order was given to him to repay the debt. The man falls on his knees. He, pl- he pleads for mercy and mercy is granted. And it says, moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and cancelled the debt. Now, just think about that. That is amazing. And Jesus is telling us something in that parable. Jesus is saying, this is what God is like. Move with compassion, the master of that servant, let him go and cancel the debt. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. Do you feel the weight of God's forgiveness in your own life? Remember, we're not going to be able to do much when it comes to uh, forgiving others unless we feel the weight of God's forgiveness. Vicky and I um, spent a couple of days this week, last week, in Montville. I don't know whether you've ever been to Montville. It's right on the edge of the cliff. And there's a little cafe there called the Edge Cafe. Any of you had coffee at the Edge Cafe? And you're overlooking this incredible vista. And, and you can see the sea and the beautiful landscape. Is that the best view of the Sunshine Coast? That's the best view. That is a magnificent view. And when we uh, come to understand the incredible gift of God, there are three words that bring up the, the, that give us that incredible vista of God's glory. When we look at these words, justice, mercy, and grace, these terms give us a great understanding of what God has done for us through his son. So justice is rightness or fairness. Justice is getting what we deserve. Mercy is compassion or kindness. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Well, actually, what do we deserve? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So this is what we deserve. We deserve to be punished. We deserve to be made to pay for our sins. But, but we come to grace, and grace is unearned favour or gift. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And this is what we don't deserve. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't deserve to have our debt cancelled. We don't deserve to be redeemed from death. We don't deserve the peace of God, the peace that passes all understanding. We don't deserve the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We don't deserve the full assurance of faith. We don't deserve the gift of everlasting life. Is there anyone here who deserves those things? We don't deserve those things. We don't deserve any of that. How does God come to us when we go wrong? Feel the weight of these words in uh, Matthew 18, verse 27. Move with compassion the master of that servant. Let him go and cancelled his debt. Jesus is telling us something wonderful about the father heart of God. This is a magnificent passage. And the telling question is this. Do you feel the weight of God's forgiveness? And what are you going to do with so weighty a forgiveness when it comes to others, when when you're hurt by others, when you're disappointed by others? The parable continues. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it. So this is what happens in the second part of the parable. The man owed a very small debt. 
the order was given to him for him to repay the debt. The man falls on his knees. He pleads for mercy, but no mercy is granted. Mercy is refused. In verse 30 it says, But he refused. Instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now this has been the man who is the recipient of the greatest mercy possible, then unable to forgive a fellow servant a small debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owned. And the, and the word for torture usually refers to intense spiritual anguish and pain in the, in the scriptures. And then, and then there are these words from Jesus at the end of the parable. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. I remember um, listening to someone who'd been in the church many years and had held an office in the church, and they spoke to me of, an, of um, an experience, a painful experience they'd had. And then at the end they said, how could you expect me to forgive them for what they did for me? And maybe this morning there's, there are people, this situation where you've been so badly hurt, you wonder, how can I? It's just not right. They don't deserve it. Why should I forgive them? Well, imagine you're on a fishing trip and someone accidentally lodges their hook in your cheek. How would, how, what would you do to get rid of the pain? Now, you might recognise someone in this picture. Now, um, now, we just want you to say, we do have a fishing trip. We have a fish, we, every year there's a fishing trip. Now, I don't want this illustration to put you off going on that fishing trip because they take every, the leaders take every precaution and this is never going to happen. So we're just using this as an illustration. What would you do to get rid of the pain? Would you leave the hook in your mouth and start yelling and shouting, look, look what they did to me. The hook is in my cheek and it hurts. How could I ever forgive them? You wouldn't do that you would make every effort to take the hook out of your cheek. You'd want, to be, you'd want to get rid of the pain. And refusing to forgive is like keeping the hook in the cheek. Can you see that? It's like having this hook, this pain. We've got to get rid of it. And having the hook in the cheek, it means you've actually made the decision not to move, move on. It means that you're staying hooked to the pain. We think that by forgiving someone, we're letting them off the hook. But it's actually the other way around. The longer you leave the hook in, the more pain it's going to cause you. When it comes to forgiveness, primarily it's not an issue of you and the other person. It's an issue of you and God. The major reason why people don't forgive is because they don't understand. Firstly, they don't feel the weight of God's forgiveness and they don't understand the true nature of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not trying to suppress or block out the painful memory. Forgiveness is not condoning what happened. There's a story of a young woman who rang a church office and told the pastor that her Christian husband was having affairs with other women. And the wife said that she continually forgave her husband and took him back, but his behaviour didn't change. And the pastor said, you need to forgive him and then you need to draw a line in the sand. 
In other words, you need to set a clear boundary. You need to take a definitive stance. And so she said to her husband, you do that one more time and I'm out of here. That was the thing that changed their relationship. The pattern changed when she drew a line in the sand. If forgiveness is genuine, if, if, if forgiveness is genuine, are there things connected to it? Do we, do we say, do we draw a line in the sand? And the reality is if you don't put an end to the cycle of abuse, it'll just continue. So it's important to take that definitive stand. The main difficulty we have with forgiveness is, that, is our memory. We remember what happened. And every time we remember, it's like being stung by a bee it, or a wasp. It's a real killer. It's a real barb. And we have that. We feel the pain. And the next feeling we have is a desire to get even. And sometimes Christians think that the, the holy thing to do is to sweep it under the carpet, to gloss over the issue, to deny the seriousness of what has happened. We want to say it doesn't matter. But in reality, it does matter. It matters very much. Listen to what God says about this. Never take your revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So in no way is God asking you to sweep the painful experience under the carpet. In fact, he's saying the opposite. He promises that if you hand the matter over to him, he will ensure that it's not swept under the carpet. When you forgive, although you're letting the other person off the hook, you're not letting them off God's hook. When you choose to forgive, you're actually taking it to a higher court. You're referring it to a higher court. You're trusting God to be the righteous judge who will weigh what was done on the scales of justice and demand that the scales balance. So we need to be patient when it comes to forgiveness. Retribution will come in God's good time. God doesn't sweep anything under the carpet. The only real choice you have is whether you will walk in the bitterness, walk in bondage to bitterness, or you will walk with freedom, the freedom of forgiveness. So as I mentioned at the start of the sermon, um, this is the last in our series. Next week is going to be different. Next week we're looking at the steps to freedom in Christ. Um, there will be a prompt sheet to prompt you of different things, different experiences, different things that may have been part of your life. Maybe you've been carrying a negative burden for such a long time that you can't imagine what it's like to be free. When you go to YouTube, you can do a search of um, animals being freed for the first time. And uh, it's amazing to see these animals, some of these animals... Like, they can't come out of the cage. They don't know what to do. And, and there's this story of this chimpanzee that's been in, inside for 14 years and it goes outside and looks at the sky and its face is full of wonder and awe. You know, maybe we've been carrying things for so long we can't imagine what it's like to be free. Steps to freedom in Christ is all about setting captives free, becoming the people God wants us to be. It might be an addiction, it might be an unhealthy pattern of behaviour. Jesus is a bondage breaker. This is not about guilt or shame. This is not about public disclosure. This is about listening to God and being honest with God about your condition. This is about having the courage to move on.
And we pray that through this process, God will give you the courage to move on. This is not about shame. This is about wholeness, healing, wellness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sorry, there's a question being asked. Can you say that again? How do you forgive yourself? Well, well um, after this message, Pastor Jamin, you're coming up and speak. Yeah. So uh, as part of, uh, will you answer that, the forgiving yourself? Because that is a really big thing. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to pray. Thank you for raising that question. We're not going to sweep that question under the carpet. Yeah, because that is a very real issue. Thank you for being so honest. Father, we, um, <clears throat> Father, we, um, we just come to the end of our series, and now we're at the point of coming to the steps to freedom in Christ. Father, we don't want to sweep anything under the carpet. We admit that we do find it hard to forgive. We find it hard to forgive ourselves, and sometimes we can hate ourselves and despise ourselves for what we did in the past. Lord Jesus, thank you that you set us free. Thank you for your power to heal us and make us whole. And we pray that over the next week we might be thinking of areas of our life, sinful patterns of behaviour that we would like to change. We just pray that you will use this process to bring wholeness, wellness and healing. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's... um. It's actually amazing the way that God moves. Thank you for your question. What was your name? Tim. Neil. Tim. Tim. Thank you, Tim. It's um, it's a way that it's amazing the way that God moves because we read the wrong passage this morning. I'm not sure how or why, but it had something in it that answers your question, Tim, because it talks about the Apostle Peter, who at the time was just called a disciple, and it says that 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 in the midst of all this court of Jesus being tried and all these accusations being laid against Jesus that that Peter was confronted you didn't know this man you're not one of his disciples are you're one of his disciples and and Peter swore curses down on himself and said no I don't know the guy I never never knew him Peter had heard Jesus say, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. And he'd heard Jesus say, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. Those were Jesus' words to Peter when he was training to be a disciple. And here we have Peter doing the very thing that Jesus said, you know, if you blow it like this, there's no recovery. And you'd think, how's Peter ever going to get past this? What on earth is going to happen? You know, after Jesus rose from the dead, he met Peter on the beach. You know what Peter had done? Peter had gone back to fishing. He'd given up on the whole Jesus thing. It was all done. Over. Yep, I'm going back. I'm, I'm done. Went back to fishing. And Jesus met Peter on the beach and he had this quiet little conversation with him. Peter was just overwhelmed at seeing Jesus. But at the same time, he he was racked with this internal grief. He couldn't forgive himself. I've done the worst thing I could do. I denied him before men. Surely it's over. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And as Peter's grappling with the grief inside his heart about what he's done, he says, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus says again, Peter, do you, do, do you really love me? And Peter's like, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. And to make matters worse, he says it a third time. He wants him to get the point here. He says, do you really love me? And Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. Jesus restores Peter 
through this personal encounter of the worst thing that he could have done and by being restored, tells Peter, you've got to let it go and get on feeding my sheep. Get on with the thing that I gave you to do. And so the way that we forgive ourselves, as John has shared, we wear that weight of what we've been forgiven of. But if we don't let that hook out of our mouth and let it go, the forgiveness of ourselves, we'll stay forever in the bondage of the sin that's holding on to us. There's a passage in Isaiah that says, Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as white as snow. Jesus calls out of darkness, let there be light, and there is light. Jesus takes things that aren't and makes them as if they are. He who the Son sets free will be free indeed. The way you forgive yourself for your sin is by accepting that that heavy weight that it was, Jesus has taken that heavy, red, crimson, blood-flowing burden and made it white as snow through what he has done for us. Because in the end, our sins weren't really against others. Our sins are against God. David said when he, when he was sinned with Bathsheba and he confessed it before the Lord in, in Psalm 52, he says, my sins were against you and you only, Lord. It is you that I've sinned against. Who's the one who needs to release us from that burden? God. And when God releases us from that burden, who are we to say No. It didn't happen. I'm happy to talk to you about it a little bit more if you like, Tim, but I I think it's important for all of us to think about this because forgiveness is actually the thing that sets prisoners free. So I I wrote a song this week as I was reflecting on these thoughts that I'm just going to share as a response reflective moment you don't need to sing along or anything like that just reflect on these words the song says how many times must I forgive he who has been forgiven much loves much just let these words sink in Forgive us our sins, Lord, 
I need to let go of my burden. Forgive us our sins, Lord. I'm so tired of hurting. Forgive us our sins, Lord. It's so hard to heal another. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Help me to release my brother. Forgive us our sins, Lord. As we forgive. times is it only seven how many times is it 70 times seven tell me how many times does the number reach to the heavens how many times must I forgive Must I forgive? So I forgive. We forgive. Help us forgive. So I forgive. I'll ask the musicians to come up. We're going to conclude our service with, um, with a benediction. The scripture says that it's him that's able to keep us from stumbling. It's him that's able to present us faultless before the presence of his glory. And you know the phrase that he follows it with? With exceeding joy. Let's stand and, and uh, sing together as we close. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faithful. If you don't know it, we'll do it a second time and you'll, you'll learn it pretty quick. Now to him who is able to keep Keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before 
the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory Why don't you join us for the second time? Now to Him. Now to Him who is able to keep, keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now. 